Um, so, so far we've looked to neural networks with one hidden layer, with data that live in a two-dimensional space, uh, and we're doing a two-class classification. Now, uh, let's say we have data that lives in a larger dimensional space, so K dimension. Uh, we're gonna have something like this, so it, again, it's like the perceptron or the logistic regression. The number of uh, uh, input neurons can be as large as you want. It doesn't change the nature of the model. It's just that you're gonna have more connections and more um, nodes in your input layer. And so by increasing the dimensionality of your data, you will mathematically augment the number of columns in your matrix W0, okay? But at the end of the day, each neuron are still doing the same thing, okay? They're all, you know, a dot product between the input vector, uh, which is here, uh, K plus one dimension, uh, lives in a K plus one dimensional space. So dot product between that K plus one vector uh, and uh, k plus one parameters. Okay, each each neuron the, the each neuron does a um, dot pro uh, product, and all those dot products can be summarized into a matrix W zero. Okay, and of course, the more input uh, neurons you have, input nodes that you have, the more parameters your model will have. Okay, and later on, I'm going to show you uh, how we classify images, and you'll see that this is going to be a huge problem sooner than later, okay? And we'll have to do something about it. And spoiler alert, the solution is called the convolution, okay? Okay, so um, this network has a K plus one times five plus one times six parameters. So if you have a very large input vector, K is gonna be very large, okay? Could be thousands, could be hundreds of thousands, so if you have uh, hundreds of thousands input uh, variables, you'll have close to uh, maybe a million number of parameters, okay? And this will eventually be a problem, okay? But just keep in mind that uh, this is what we have. Another way of increasing the capacity of the model is by increasing the number of input layers, okay? So let's, what did I do here? Um, so I have the input layer, uh, followed by um, here, one, two, three, four, five neurons. So between that input layer and those five neurons, I have a matrix W0 that contains K plus one times five parameters. I decided to add the bias, okay? Now I have one, two, three, four, five, six neurons. Uh, connected to one, two, three neurons, so between there and there, I have a matrix that is three times six, contains three times six, so 18 parameters. And at the end, it's a two-class classification. I have an output neuron, okay, that is a sigmoid, that hasn't changed. And uh, that output neuron is connected to these four neurons. So in fact, it's four values, it's a vector, so we're gonna do a dot product between W and the output of those neurons, and with this dot product, we're gonna feed it to a sigmoid, okay? And again, the output of our network is gonna be the estimation of the probability of being in class one, okay? And that function here, what does that neural, neural network does? It tries to, you know, it, it implements essentially that function here, sigmoid of the dot product between W and the output of a sigmoid, which, is fed with the multiplication between matrix W1 times the output of the first layer. So it's, you know, it's a function inside a function, inside a function, and then you have an answer, okay? And the more uh, hidden layer that you have, the more complex the function at the end you're gonna have. And intuitively, the more complex it is, the more nonlinearity that you have, the more, uh, capable that neural network will be at, you know, fitting onto highly uh, non-linearly separable uh, data, okay? So here, uh, if we say, uh, for example, k is equal to, uh, I don't know, four, 
Then we have four plus one, five. So we have five times five parameters, 25, plus three times six, 18 parameters, plus six, four by four, 16 parameters, plus seven by five parameters, 35, plus eight parameters. So a total of few hundred, what, close to 100 parameters, okay, roughly in this, in this neural network. Okay, so the more hidden layers that we have, the deeper the network gets. Okay, so again, you know, this, uh, uh, this notion of deep learning, um, uh, it's a marketing uh, thing, more of a, more than anything else, okay? Like the notion of neuron, it's a marketing thing. It's, we're not implementing uh, actual neurons that we have in the brain. And deep network, it's, when we say deep network, we also of, often see the, a brain uh, that is, uh, you know, uh, stylized in some way and it's deep, so you go deep into things. Okay, at the end of the day, it's, it's that, it's nothing more than this, okay? For a, a multi-layer perceptron, at least. Okay. This is a very important slide, at least to give you the intuition of what's going on in a neural network. You say, you, you remember when I was telling you, when data is not linearly separable, what can we do? I said, okay, you can acquire more data. That's one possibility. And then hopefully with more data, things are gonna become all by magic, linearly separable. But then I said, okay, most of the time, even by acquiring more data, having more observations, uh, things are still not linearly separable. So what we can do, we can take the input feature space, the data into the input feature space, and project it to a new feature space where things are linearly separable. So maybe some of you, uh, in terms of projection to a new feature space, uh, some of you are familiar with PCA, okay, Principal Component Analysis. Now, pre PCA is very nice, but it's very simplistic because it does things in a linear fashion and it projects things to a smaller dimensional space. You cannot go up, you can just go down most of the time. Uh, here, the perceptron, what it does, it can be understood as follows. It takes as input uh, a vector x, okay? that live, so the, the, those, those vector x's live in a space where things are not linearly separable. Then you have a machine, okay? You have a function. So I'm looking at all those hidden layers. So th those <coughs> hidden layers implement a cascade of nonlinear function. And at the end, what do we have, okay? So this boils down to the what, third slides I had today. Um, we have a linear classifier. It's a dot product, okay, those last lines here, that, 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 that. It's a dot product. Between what? Well, you had your input vector x, then something happened, then your uh, input vector x, which was in the k-dimensional space, now lives in a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven dimensional space, okay, mathematically. And that point in a seven-dimensional space, you feed it to a linear classifier, okay? And, and then you give it to a sigmoid, so, so you have a probability function, okay? So what do you do? You, um, here's an illustration that I made. So let's say you have these points that lives in a two-dimensional space, so 2D because it's easy to represent. So these points are not linearly separable. And so I implemented a two-layer network, and at the end of the second layer, uh, I've put two neurons, again, in order to be able to visualize what's going on. So these two neurons, uh, each neuron outputs a real value, that neuron and that neuron, so two real values. So that means if, you know, for each point, whether it is green or, or, or uh, uh, whether it is uh, red or blue, I can take that 2D position, so that becomes a 2D point here. I can you know, feed it to that network and look what's the outcome of those two uh, neurons. The outcome of two, those two neurons is something like that. So I took all of the points in the initial space, the input space, and look what happened. And now all of a sudden, everything is linearly separable. And that was done like by magic because what did the, the neural network did? 
the neural network had to unfold the space so that points could be linearly separable because that's what the loss is based on. Okay? I have a linear classifier with, a, let's say in this case, a cross-entropy loss. And when the, um, the score is very bad, when the loss is very large, then you get to have a large gradient. And what does happen with the gradient? Then your, the gradient tells the system to adjust its parameters so that the loss becomes small. But how can the loss become small? The loss can only become small when data at the end are linearly separable. So that's like a neural network. So it can be seen as a machine that estimates conditional probability. That's all very correct. But it can always also be seen as a method for unfolding the space, for taking input vectors and project it to a new dimensional space where things are linearly separable. Okay, And then you just have to fit a line like this. OK, how do we uh, have a k-class neural network with k-output neuron? Uh, well, it's always the same story. So if you want to have k-classes, you need to have k-output neurons. Okay. So here I have uh, four classes. So I have four output neurons. Um, and each of those neurons, again, implement a dot product. So it's an hyperplane in this. Uh, here it would be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight dimensional space. So you have eight hyperplane, uh, four hyperplane in the eight dimensional space because you have four classes. <coughs> and so uh, if that's your architecture, so you have k dimensional uh, input uh, vectors, four classes, four hidden layer network. If that is your network, that's it, okay? That's what you have. So the, at the output of each output neuron, uh, you have essentially a, a dot product. Uh, well, uh, you can implement, you need a loss. You can implement an inch loss, or uh, it could be a perceptron criterion. It would, it would be working like a charm. Or if you decide to put a softmax, which is you take the output of each neuron, uh, feed it to an exponential function and then normalize it. Uh, by doing this, you can use a cross-entropy loss. Okay, that will minimize uh, the loss. And will assume that the output, I haven't put it there, but the, will assume that the output is a conditional probability on each class. Okay. Okay, so far so good. So how do we make a prediction? Okay, so let's say I have a network like that. You have a vector x and you want to know in which class this you know vector x belongs to uh, you need to make a prediction you need to have your system make a prediction um, so how can you do this well it follows some very important buzzword okay and other buzzwords those that are have been uh, working on deep learning maybe i've seen this the forward pass so forward pass is what like it's 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 just the natural flow of information from the input to the output. So I took this uh, two hidden layer network is quite simple. So at the beginning, all I have is x, a point in the two dimensional space that I augment by one to include the bias. And, uh, and then what do I do? First, I will take that vector x and multiply it by the first matrix. So the matrix of the first hidden layer. So by multiply w times x, it gives me a new vector. Then that new vector, I will feed it to a sigmoid. Okay, So the output of those one, two, three, four, five neurons are going to be values between 0 and 1. Then I will add 1. Okay, I will add 1 to include another bias. <clears throat> multiplied by the second matrix w1. That will give me, so the result of all those operations will give me a point in a two-dimensional space, okay? A new dimension, a 2D uh, space. I will feed this to a sigmoid, so that will be two values between zero and one. I will in, in add one to include a bias, multiply a dot product with a, a vector w, and then feed this to a sigmoid, okay? This is what we call the forward pass, okay? Information goes from the input 
And it's always the same story. It goes from the input, multiply matrix, apply non-linearity. This results multiplied by another matrix, apply non-linearity, non multiply by another matrix, apply another non-linearity up until when you reach the output of your neuron, uh, the, of your network. And then you compute the loss. And then you show the loss on a graphics and hopefully the loss, if you're optimizing your network, you should see the loss uh, decreasing. Okay, so how to optimize a network? Well, first and foremost, you have to define what loss you want to implement. So L has to be defined. We have seen a few ones. Uh, also, you have to define, are you going to use lambda? And okay, what kind of value of lambda you're going to use? So if you use zero, it's as if you had no re regularization. But most of the time, we, you know, we do some re regularization. Um, so you choose inch loss, cross entropy loss. There are many other losses uh, that I'm not going to, you know, address in this class. But Christian will show some uh, tomorrow. I think. Yes. Kind of. Yes. Okay. Um, and do not forget to adjust the output of your uh, uh, the, the output layer with the loss that you have chosen. So if you choose to implement a SVM loss, uh, you're not supposed to have a cross entropy at the end. So some people, you know, uh, uh, they don't quite understand what they're doing. So they have an, you know, the output is a softmax, and then they uh, they implement the inch loss. You know that there's that doesn't quite work. Uh, so make sure you're you're doing things correctly. Uh, and then you need to compute the gradient of this big loss. So, you, so we have this, uh, uh, frightening equation. Okay. So it's essentially it's the equation of the loss that we have that we need to derive with respect to our parameters. Okay. Because if we implement a gradient descent, then that means every single parameters in our neural network. Let me go back. Okay. So all of those lines are assigned to a parameter. So that means when you're doing gradient descent, you need to compute the gradient of the loss with respect of, with respect to all of these parameters in order to, you know, increase a little bit each time you do a gradient step, you need to increase a little bit or decrease a little bit all of those parameters. So the loss, decreases overall. Okay, so you, the performance of your model improves. So for this, we need to compute this unelegant derivative. Uh, that could be frightening, okay. Um, in order to implement that equation here, which is the gradient descent. So what is this? So those subscripts, so it's, so these are W are all the parameters of my network. Uh, so C is a certain uh, layer, uh, a certain layer C. And A, B, because W is most of the time a matrix, so it's element A and B in that matrix. So we have to compute the gradient of that loss with respect to each and every parameter of our model. So how can we do this? Um, well, uh, that calls for another very important buzzword in the machine learning and deep learning uh, called uh, backpropagation. So how can we do this? Okay, so before we... Um, wait a second. I think I made a little mistakes. Um, okay, no, no, no. It's, it's fine. Sorry. Uh, sorry. Okay. Um, we need to implement backpropagation. So how does backpropagation works? I'm going to give you an insight of um, how it works. By no means will you have enough information to actually implement it. Okay. If you want to really implement backpropagation, you'll have to sit down and really carefully understand what's going on. So I'm just going to give you the outline of the approach. So remember, let's say you have a neural network like this one. So that neural network has a certain number of layers. Most all of those layers have a matrix of parameters. At the end, since it's a, it's a two-class um, uh, parameter, you have a vector. 
and uh, the output is given by y, and then you have the loss. Okay, that's pretty much the, what we have. So I said, you know, when you do a forward pass, you take some input information and you feed it to the network and have it flow all the way to the end. So when we do this, okay, you, you, you know, when we do a forward pass, what do we do, okay? We do, we take the input vector, multiply it by matrix W0, that would give you a certain vector that I call it A here. Okay, so A can be seen like a function that take a matrix W and multiply by X, okay? And then we take A, the result of that first operation, and feed it to a nonlinearity, here a sigmoid. That gives, I call it B, okay? And then you take B and you multiply it by a second matrix, W1. That gives C, and then you do what with C? You feed it with, to a sigmoid, that will give you D, and you take D and you dot product with the uh, vector W uh, at the end, that will give you E, feed E to a sigmoid, that will give you Y, W, the output of your network. And, uh, and Y, what do you do with, with it? You feed it to a loss function. Okay, that's essentially what we did, right? It's a cascade of operation, and each of, each of those operations are like, input to another operation, and that result is inputted to another operation, and so on and so forth. This is the spirit of the forward pass. Now, how do we get to compute that derivative here, okay? Well, we'll be using the chain rule. So for those who do not recall what the chain rule is, um, here's a crash course of 30 second crash course. Okay, so a uh, little recap, let's say you have a, so for just one minute, forget about neural networks, okay? Let's say you just have a function f of u uh, that depends of uh, u square, and the function u depends on v, let's say u is equal to 2v, and v depends, you know, it depends on x, and it's equal to one over x, okay? If I, if I tell you what is the derivative of f uh, with respect to x, well, since f doesn't depend on x, you cannot just compute it directly. So you have to apply a, uh, a trick called the uh, chain rule. And the chain rule says what? Well, if you want to compute the derivative of f, f with respect to x, you have to first compute the derivative of x with respect to its input, which is u, and then compute the derivative of u with respect to v, because if u has only one input, it is v, and then compute the derivative of v with respect to x. So the derivative of x with respect to u, that's very easy, it's 2u. The derivative of u with respect to v, it's, uh, it's 3. There's a typo here, sorry. Uh, many sorry about that. That's why you're, la you're laughing. Eh? Okay, uh, and then the derivative of um, v with respect to x is uh, minus 1 over x squared. So that's what we did, okay, right? So you, you, we did a chain rule and we got the, our solution. Well, it happens here that we have a function, say the loss, that only depends on y, okay? And then we have a function y that only depends on e. And then we have a function e that depends on d, and d that depends on c, and c that depends on b, and b that depends on a, and a that depends on x, okay? So if I say, Compute the derivative of the loss with respect, let's say, to a parameter here, w1, okay? Well, you, can, you cannot, well, it would be very difficult to compute directly this. What's far more easier is to use the chain rule. First, compute the derivative of L with respect to y, uh, to y, then the derivative of y with respect to e, the derivative of e with respect to d, and so on and so forth, uh, all the way to where you want to, you know, reach uh, all the way to your, you know, uh, parameters that you want to find the derivative. So let's say, for example, you want to compute the derivative of your loss with respect to some parameters in the first layer here. So you'll compute this long equation. That's not that nasty, okay, if you just pay attention to it. It's the derivative of the loss with respect to the only input of the loss, which is y, okay? And that derivative, we, if you have the cross entropy, we know that what equation it is. If, if the loss is something else than the cross entropy, usually it should be a function that you can derive 
from the input. So that's kind of easy. Then you compute the derivative of y with respect to e. And this is just a sigmoid. And uh, you can easily f show that the derivative of sigmoid is a function sigmoid times 1 minus sigmoid. But that's kind of easy. Then you have to compute the derivative of e with respect to d. So this is a linear function. It's very easy. Okay? The derivative of e with respect to d, it's y. Okay. Uh, it's, it's w, sorry. Then you compute the derivative of d with respect to c, and all the way to the very last term here, the derivative of b with respect to w0. Okay? And the derivative of uh, another typo, oh my goodness, uh, sorry. Okay, so the derivative of a with respect to w0, which would be x. Okay, and then you compute all of this together. So back propagation is what? See, we went from the input, computed a, and then b, and then c, and then d, and then e, and then y, and then the loss. Okay, that's the forward path. If you want to compute the derivative with res between the loss and some of the parameters, yeah, well, you will compute the derivative of the loss with respect to y, and then the derivative of y with respect to e, and then the derivative of e with respect to d, then the derivative of d with respect to c, and those, this, this chain rule will start with the end of the network and will back propagate all the way to the input. And as it back propagates, uh, the, 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 the gradient will go through all of those connections. And as it goes through those connections, it will provide to those connections with the correct gradient. And you can use that gradient to optimize those parameters. Okay? That's for the intuition. Okay? So if you had to implement this, um, well, okay, it, it, it would take some time. Usually, it's by experience. It's usually the the the, the most you know uh, problematic aspect of training a neural network from scratch. Okay, if you implement everything, all you have is you know a NumPy function, import NumPy as NP, and that's it. And I say implement a neural network. Having feed forward uh, function is very easy. Implementing a back propagation is a bit more tricky. Okay. So it's not that complicated, but it's a little bit different, uh, d difficult. OK, um, activation function. So during the, uh, the, 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 the end zone sessions, uh, you will see uh, other buzzwords that I think are very important to uh, understand. So uh, those buzzwords are associated to other activation functions. Okay, so far the only activation function we have seen, uh, well, we saw the, uh, the sine function, okay, fine. But then we, you know, we look at the sigmoid activation function. And historically, uh, sigmoid was used heavily. Up until when um, people started to uh, realize that it has a certain number of shortcomings, a certain number of problems. So what are those problems? Um, well, first, you know, we're computing the derivative, okay? Like, if I go back, in that chain rule, okay, we compute the derivative, let's say the derivative of d with respect to c. So we have to compute the derivative of a sigmoid, okay? And uh, if you compute the derivative of a sigmoid, uh, well, if the input of your sigmoid is close to zero, the gradient is going to be very large, right? So the derivative is the gradient, it's the slope. However, if for some reason your input signal flows through your network and often has uh, the output of some, of, ne ne um, uh, some neurons are very positive or very negative, okay, very, very positive here or more negative, you'll see that the derivative of that sigmoid will be close to zero, all right? The slope is kind of, this is called the gradient saturation. And this is a very important problem because if, if your sigmoid saturates, then that means your gradients are gonna be close to zero. If the gradients are close to zero, that means your gradient descent is gonna be super slow. It would never converge, okay? That's a very important problem. There's another problem is that this function here goes between zero and plus one, so it's not zero centered. And this brings some problem. I don't have time to uh, 
uh, discuss it so much. And you have to compute an exponential, which is kind of expensive, okay, kind of. So the, the, the main problem with this activation function is that optimizing a neural network with sigmoids all over the place is very slow. It's slow like hell, okay? So uh, over time, there's a certain number of different activation functions that have been used and proposed. So many years ago, Yann Lecun, uh, some of uh, well-known Frenchman, uh, who is one of the founding fathers of uh, deep learning, uh, first uh, proposed TAN-H. So TAN-H is like a sigmoid, however, it is zero-centered, okay? So it goes from minus one to plus one. So this is good, but again, uh, you have the, the problem with the, uh, the problem of having very small gradients when you have large values, very positive or very negative values, okay? So this is, kind of a problem. So the famous function, uh, famous function was proposed, uh, I, here I, I gave a reference, but it's, it's not the correct one. Uh, it was proposed before that. Uh, the famous um, rectified linear unit, or redu, uh, which is like the de facto solution nowadays in most deep learning method. It's a nonlinear function, right? However, um, here, there's no plateau, okay? So even if, if the output, if what a neuron receives is very positive, uh, you're still gonna have large gradients. So no gradient killing, so that's good. Uh, this makes your optimization super fast. However, it's not zero centered and there's no gradient for negative values. So essentially what it says, the review function says what? It says that uh, we're only gonna consider neurons that return positive values. Everything that is negative will ignore it, okay? And uh, so this, what it, if you implement a redu function intuitively, um, what it says, it says that, you know what? My neurons are gonna get activated, okay? They're, they're gonna return something positive each time something significant for that neuron has been shown to the network, okay? So uh, we'll see later on uh, ConvNet. So uh, ConvNet has neurons. Uh, if you implement those neurons with a redo activation function, which is like what happens most of the time, well, you have neurons that, are, that will eventually get uh, specialized into recognizing faces, okay? So if you show a picture with a face, that neuron will get activated, will get excited and return positive values. And if you have something that really doesn't look like a face, the neuron will not start producing negative value because negative value would kind of mean that for that neuron, this is an anti-face. It's really not a face, okay? Well, it doesn't do that. It just returns zero, okay? So intuitively, this is how a review function works. Um, Maybe during the end-on sessions, you will have the opportunity to try other activation functions. You have the famous leaky review, which uh, is uh, like non-zero for the negative values. So there's no uh, gradient saturation for uh, negative values. However, uh, it, you know, it, it, it requires you to set yet another hyperparameter, which is not, not cool because often we have already a lot of hyperparameters to set. Um, <clears throat> there was the parametric review, so uh, where you have an alpha value here, which is not anymore an hyperparameter, it's just a parameter of the network that the network can learn with backpropagation. Um, and other uh, activation functions, CLU uh, functions that have different shapes have been proposed. But in reality, uh, when you implement a neural network, uh, by default, people use redu, okay? And then you can try other activation function like leaky redu or parametric redu or ilu. This is another one I, I haven't showed, but it's exponential redu type of a thing. Uh, and check for the one that best suits your problem, but my guess is that redu is gonna be good enough. You may try uh, 10H but uh, you might end up with suboptimal results. And most importantly, uh, your, 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 train, your, your network will take like forever to train. And just don't use sigmoid, okay? Sigmoid uh, are, were great from a historical perspective. Don't use it except 
if you have a two-class problem, so you'll use a sigmoid at the output of your network. But in the uh, hidden layers, don't use sigmoid anymore, okay? Okay, this is where we get to the point where we look at the <coughs> shortcomings of uh, multi-layer perceptron and why uh, people, uh, because you know, those neural networks and everything I've been teaching you uh, since this morning uh, was known for years, in fact. It was already known uh, at the end, in the 1980s and the beginning of the 1990s. But yet, you know, I remember when I started my, uh, you know, I started doing research. It was uh, many years ago, okay, around the year 2000, roughly. Uh, back then, uh, I remember that uh, people were laughing at neural networks. Uh, people were saying, you know, uh, uh, researchers that work in neural networks, that's an MIT professor that used to tell me this. He says, these people, they work on neural networks because they want their paper accepted, because they want people to believe that they're implemented in an in, in actual brain. And, uh, and neural networks don't work. This, is, this was the main, okay, m you know, the, the main message that would, so, uh, you know, this uh, Inton, uh, Benjo, and the, uh, they, they, these guys still believe that there was something, you know, to, to, to suck out of neural network, and there was great promises. But most people didn't believe in this, and so th that's the reason why, you know, t through the year 2000, 2010, uh, people were implementing uh, random forests and SVM and kernel SVM, uh, to, to deal with the nonlinearity thing. And I'm going to show you why uh, multilayer perceptron can be quickly a real problem and why it doesn't kind of work if you just implement it as is. Let's try to classify an image, okay? So let's say you have an image like this one. This is a very simple image, a 28 by 28 image that shows just a digit, okay? Well, 28 by 28, that means you have 784 different pixels. You can assume that all of those pixels are a value between 0 and 255. So you can take all of those pixels, put it in a one-dimensional vector, okay, that is very long. And uh, each of those pixels become an input uh, neuron, okay, and then you have the last one here is the bias, okay, so you have 784 nodes in your input layer, okay? And just in layer one, here we, I have a, in my hidden layer, I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten uh, neurons. So between there and there, you have 10 times uh, 785 nodes. So that means you have 7,850 7, different parameters. Just to classify a simple image like this one. That's a lot of parameters. That's a lot of uh, capacity, okay? And at the end, I have uh, 10 classes, okay? It's like a problem for classif uh, classifying digits of, uh, that would go from zero to nine, for example. Let's take an image like this one, okay? An MR image of a brain, just a 2D slice that contains 256 by 256 different pixels. Then you have a total uh, 65,536 pixels if you add the bias, then you have just in the first layer, you have more than half a million number of parameters. This is humongous. This, this is just huge for just one hidden layer, okay? This is a lot of capacity with a simple network. Now, this is not even reality. Reality is uh, when you acquire a brain, you just take several classes, uh, several uh, slices, and uh, if you consider all of the class, uh, slices, uh, put all of the pixels from all of those slices, put it in a one-dimensional feature, ve uh, feature vector, then just in the first layer, you have 160 million number of parameters, and that doesn't just fit in memory. It's just too big. So since there are way too many parameters, so people used to say, well, okay, it doesn't fit in memory. Uh, you'll have all kinds of trouble because the, the network is, has far too many uh, parameters, so it has too much capacity. Uh, so people for years have been extracting features from images. Okay, so instead of 
looking at pixels, people would say, well, okay, maybe we should look at edges. So we would first take the uh, image, apply an edge detector, and then from those edges, compute so-called HUG, okay, histogram of gradient uh, features, and so on and so forth. And then that you, manually, you would extract some features. That way, your images would live in a smaller uh, feature space, and then you would use because yet things are not linearly separable, you would use a kernel SVM or a random forest to do, the, you know, to do it all. And back then, almost nobody would even consider using uh, neural networks. Okay, so how do we get to, so the problem is the number of parameters. How do we get to reduce the number of parameters and yet to have good results? This is really unintuitive. But when you look at the results, you say, oh my God, I wish it, you know, I wish I had that idea. Uh, every day I tell myself, I wish I had that idea before. Uh, but uh, I didn't have that idea, someone else before me did. So the idea is that we have way too many parameters, okay? So stay with me because something unintuitive is gonna show up. So this is the, uh, the, the <coughs> typical neural network, okay? Each neuron is connected, each neuron is connected to the every other neuron in the previous layer, okay? This is what we have seen so far. This is a multi-layer perceptron. So if we have a 150 dimensional input vector and then 150 neurons in the first layer, we'll have more than 20,000 parameters. And that's the problem. We have too many parameters and we have to reduce this down. So one thing that we can do is to take every neuron in one layer and connect it to a subset of neurons in the previous layer. So for example, let's say um, one neuron here would be connected to only three neurons in the previous layer. If we were to do this, since here we have, let's say, 150, uh, 150 neurons, well, it would be 150 times one, two, three. Okay, so this neuron, one to three parameters, this neuron, one to three parameters, this neuron, one to three parameters. So you have 150 times three parameters. For that specific configuration, uh, at that first layer, you'll have 450 parameters. So it's already a good drop in the number of uh, parameters. And then you can even, re uh, even furthermore reduce the number of parameters by doing something that is even less intuitive, which is to share parameters. So that means if you take that, hello, okay, that neuron there, this neuron is gonna be, let's say, connected to three neurons in the previous layer. This one here is gonna be connected to also three neurons. This one here, this one, and all the way to the last one, which will be connected to three neurons. But those weights, okay, W0, W1, W2, W0, W1, W0, 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 okay? They're all gonna be shared, okay? They're all gonna be the same, okay? So that means between that layer here and that layer there, you're only gonna have three parameters. So we went from more than 20,000 parameters down to three, okay? This is a compression. That's called a severe compression. So what's going on here? Let me just take you gently through what's going on. Let's say we have that configuration, one layer of neurons and another layer of neurons, and that layer here, that neuron here is connected to uh, three neurons in the previous layer with those weights, okay? So let's say, for example, this is the input layer, and these are the values of the input layers, okay? I've put random values. And let's say, for example, those weights, okay, are these ones, minus 0.1, 0.2 and minus 0.3. So what will happen? You'll do a dot product, okay? Dot product between this and this, this and this, this and this, and the sum of all of that. And then you feed this to a activation function. Here I use the sigmoid. Um, although I said don't never use sigmoid, but let's say I use a sigmoid. And then sigmoid of that thing gives you 0.25, okay? That's the output of that neuron. Then you take this other neuron, connected to three, uh, you know, uh, neurons at the previous layer, um, and then do the same operation. Take the same weights and 
do a dot product and feed this to a sigmoid. In this case, it would give 0.45. And then do the same here, all the way to the end. Okay? Does that ring you a bell, that operation? You take this, 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 dot product, dot product, dot product, all the way to the end, dot product. Okay? So this, this, this is a convolution. Okay, so that, it's really a good idea when you think about it, okay? A convolution is a series of dot products uh, between a, f uh, a signal, which is the uh, input signal, and a feature, um, and a filter, which is, uh, whose weights are shared across uh, your signal, okay? This is the definition of a, of a convolution. In the case of an image, okay, you'll do what? Let's say that image here uh, is the input of your uh, network. So instead of connecting each pixel to each and every uh, neuron in the first layer, uh, first hidden layer, which would lead to a catastrophically large number of parameters, well, you do what? You'll take, uh, you'll take this uh, neuron here, you'll connect it to a subset of pixels, and you will filter that little region with a dot product, and the, the content of the, 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 the filter is gonna be shared across all of the neurons. Okay, so you'll do this again, and again, and again, and again, and again. And if the output, you were to put in an image the output of all those neurons, it would give you something like that, an image that got filtered. So maybe you had some image processing classes. I teach image processing in Sherbrooke University. So lucky students who have my image processing class. And typically, in a, almost every session um, of the class, I keep saying that, you know, uh, you can do this, but um, if you were to implement a machine learning method, it would be even better. So um, I advertise my machine learning class. Um, so maybe you have implemented this, right? You have a filter like a Gaussian filter that you apply to an image and that, that would lead to a blurry image or an edge detector fi filter or a Laplacian filter that you apply in an image and then you, you, you get the, the edges that to, you know, to step out. Here, if we implement that kind of neural network where uh, weights are being shared, you have a network that learns the content of filters, okay? So your network will learn the best filter to apply to an image in order to improve uh, a classification function or a regression function, okay? So, so one layer, okay, of a convnet is pretty much that. It's essentially the content of a previous layer, here it is X, convoluted with a filter uh, weight W, and since, since the weights are shared, you don't have a lot of parameters. And the rest, so the result of that is fed to a nonlinearity function, let's say, for example, a sigmoid, or it could be a redu, a leaky redu, whatever function that you want, okay? This is what we call a big buzzword, a feature map, okay? So in your session, of course, you will talk about feature maps. I'm just making sure that you know, you're talking, teaching the right things. So, um, so, <laughs> So, of course, if you have different filters, that would lead to different results, right? So, uh, it could be a blurry image, it could be a result with just a few edges here and there, uh, you might have an image with some ripples here and there, and so on and so forth, okay? So, here in, the, in this example, uh, I have a network that would learn one, two, three, four, five different filters, okay? If those filters are three by three filters, then that means you have three by three by five parameters for that specific layer, which is very little when you think about that. Okay, so all those filtered images called feature maps, you can stack it up. Okay, that's usually what we do. Is we stack it up so it's easier to at least to picture, to represent in a slide like this one. So here I have five feature map in my convolutional layer. Of course, I could, and, and this is typically what we, how it is pictured. Um, it is depicted where you stacked up all of the feature maps, like this one here, I have five. Imagine that one, this 
uh, red thing is one feature map, and one neuron of that feature map is connected to a subset of the previous layer, okay? Because it implements a convolution. Now, of course, you can have, uh, you can have k feature maps in your convolution layer, okay? So that's a typical conv layer. So when you think conv layer, you think at having uh, filters that are used to convolute the previous layer. Here, the previous layer is the input image. And the network learns those filters, okay? So if in your problem, in order to minimize the loss, you need an edge detector, somehow the neural network would get to learn to uh, detect edges. If you don't need a uh, edge detector, you need a, I don't know, a blob detector or a texture detector, yet the, 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 the neural network will learn to, you know, the correct filters to extract those uh, visual features. Yes? So we don't talk anymore about neurons. Yes, you can talk, these are neurons. Yes, we use the, the word filters because now the, the, the way it is implemented, uh, it's a convolution, but at the end of the day, all of those like pixels there are actual neurons. This is the output of the neuron that I've put in an image so you can visualize it. I know it's kind of, that's why I was saying it's not very intuitive, but yes, these are still neurons that are connected to the previous layer and uh, the result of that operation is a dot product with an activation function. This is the definition of a neuron. So uh, typically in a convnet, uh, we also take those layers and reduce their size. Why? In order to have, for all kinds of good reasons that Christian will explain tomorrow, I think I saw some of your slides, but we reduce the size of the, the, size of the layers, mainly to reduce the amount of memory, okay? So uh, pooling layers, what do they do? Uh, in fact, we need to, here I went from a 256 by 256 uh, feature map down to a 100, 100, 128 by 128. And as you can see, those feature maps on the right are just smaller. They contain, they have the same content, they're just smaller. So how do you take an image and reduce it? Uh, if you had image processing class, you know that you can do this by just applying a little averaging locally, or there's a very famous max pooling that essentially takes, uh, let's say, two by two uh, neurons and took the maximum value and take that maximum value and put it in the new feature map, okay? So max pooling or average pooling, it's, most, of, most people use max pooling, but you can try average pooling to see uh, what it does. Um, and then those uh, feature maps at the output of the pooling layer will eventually get filtered again, okay? So that second conv layer, what does it learn? It learns filters applied on the filtered images. This is where it gets kind of in, unintuitive. So at the beginning, you filter the input image, so the neurons get to play with input pixels, so you filter the input uh, image, so what the resulting feature maps are like, they, they kind of make sense. But then later on, uh, the other conv layers, they learn uh, filters that combine filtered images, okay? And then you uh, typically apply another pool layer, and then you keep doing this all the way to the end. As you can see, the, uh, the, the, the layers are reducing in size. And typically, at the end of a convnet, you have a fully connected layer. So the, the, the same type of layer that we have seen in the MLP, okay, the multi-layer perceptron. So typically, you will have one or two of those fully connected layers. But here, the dimensionality of the data is going to be much smaller. Okay? So that way, the number of uh, parameters to implement that little MLP is not going to be catastrophically large. And at the end, if you're doing a two-class classification, you can take all of those neurons and apply a dot product and feed this to a sigmoid. Okay, that doesn't change. And the output of your, uh, of your network is still called YW. Okay, this is a two-class CNN. CNN is, CNN is convolutional neural network. Not the news channel, of course. Okay, and, and if you want to implement uh, the... Um, and you want to minimize uh, 
in fact, you want to train this, um, uh, this neural net, you have to minimize the loss. What, what kind of loss can you implement? Well, you can implement a cross entropy loss. Okay, so that didn't change. The output of your ne uh, network here is still a probability. If it's a probability, then uh, you can use a cross entropy loss and it's gonna work just, just fine. And how do you get to minimize? Yeah, you can implement a gradient descent, a stochastic gradient descent. To implement the stochastic gradient descent, you have to compute the gradient of the loss with respect to all of the parameters in each of those layers. How can you compute this? With the back propagation. Okay, so you know, everything gets connected. So if you want to have a K-class CNN, well, in, all you have to do is to multiply the number of output neurons here. So you'll have one output neuron per class. And if you have uh, softmax, then you'll have uh, three output for three classes. Those three outputs can be seen like probability functions, so conditional probability functions. Uh, that will essentially, so, so that entire system becomes a machine for predicting in which, what's the probability of that image to be in that specific class or that other specific class. Okay, so that's, that's the, the, the thing I was mentioning before. I took that uh, nice image from a paper, an archive paper, 2018. So it summarized, they, they kind of summarized their ConvNet, which, which is relatively easy to see. So it's one slice of a brain, okay, with a tumor here. So it's 96 by 96 image, and it has four, uh, feature um, four um, uh, modalities. So T1, probably T1, T2, flare, and proton density, something like that. Then it goes through uh, a first layer of convolution. Uh, okay, first layer of convolution, followed, they decide in their design to have a yet another layer of convolution, then a max pooling, then a series of conf, conf, max pool, conf, conf, max, and each time I say conf, think about, you know, you have neurons, neurons is a dot product with activation function. So, so each convolution layer, you have to specify which activation function you want to use. So it's conf, conf, max pooling, conf, conf, max pooling, conf, conf, max pooling, a certain number of times. Then, uh, when you reach a certain point here, uh, you have a vector that is 128 by 8 by 8. So they linearize it, create a multi-layer perceptron, so one through three layers. And then at the output, it's a two class, so they've put, uh, that's a question that was raised uh, previously. At the output, instead of having just a sigmoid, they decided to have two neurons at the output, and they, they mentioned here softmax, okay? So they implemented a softmax. Okay, so, so that's pretty much it for uh, a very basic CNN, and it works like a charm, okay? And why does it work like a, this is another illustration of a CNN, so you have an input image, and then you have a series of convolution layer, pooling layer, convolution layer, pooling layer, and an MLT and MLP at the end. And at the very end, you have one output for each class. Okay? And if there was a softmax here, the output is a probability function. Okay? Now the beauty of the thing is that the, 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 the filters that got learned uh, get specialized at doing a certain thing. Okay? Like for example, the very first um, uh, filter here gets specialized at typically detecting edges. And then since those filters here, they filter filtered images, you know, uh, well, they, they get specialized at recognizing like body parts, for example, if, if you had faces in your data set, which is the case here. And eventually down the, you know, down the road, you'll have neurons that get specialized into recognizing faces. Okay. This is kind of unintuitive to understand. There's a huge body of literature on how you get to visualize this, how you get to make sure that a neuron is really specialized at recognizing a face or not. Um, there's a nice body of literature on this, but that's the main power of a deep convnet. Everything is learned end-to-end. -end. Okay. Previously, I was telling you, you know, uh, 10 plus years ago, people would take an image, extract features like edges and stuff, so extract manually design, define edges, and then use afterwards um, SVM or a kernel SVM. 
So extracting features was one first operation, and then you train a system. Here, you do both at the same time. You, ex you learn to extract the correct fe features while you're training a classification function. And so this is what that's the so-called end-to-end training. That's the beauty of uh, deep learning. One thing I haven't mentioned, so uh, how much time do I have left? Uh, 25 minutes. I have 25 minutes left. Okay, uh, batch processing. This is another very important buzzword for all of those who will do uh, ends on the ends on session, and then I will have time to play my little game, uh, kind of. Okay, so what is batch processing? Okay, follow me. I'll go back to the very first uh, network that I showed you uh, at the beginning of the presentation. That very simple linear classifier. Okay, so let's say you have this linear classifier, which is the simplest neural network one can think of, okay? So you have a bias plus uh, x1, x2. If you have, you, you want to know what's the output of your network, it's very easy. You take a dot product, okay, it would give you something like that. You feed this to an activation function, let's say a sigmoid, that would give you a score of 0 0.125, okay? And that can be seen as a, understood as a probability value. Now let's say you have, and you can do this, okay, right? It's sigmoid of a dot product, and the dot product is the multiplication between that vector and that vector, okay? That's, okay, fairly simple. Okay, now let's say uh, you have, uh, sorry, I have a little typo. Sorry about that. That's embarrassing because I'm being filled. Okay, uh, let's say you have two uh, input vector, okay? And you want to, so two new patients that show up and you want to know for each patient, what's, is, it, is that patient uh, sick or healthy, okay? So, well, you can do those, the, the, these processes, that, that little process, simple process of computing a dot product and then feed this to a sigma two, two times, okay? So take parameters, dot product with the, um, with the feature vector of first patient, then do the same thing with the feature vector of the second patient and look at the output of the network, okay? Mathematically, you could do something a little bit different. And at the end of the day, the result would be the same. Okay, so stick with me. You could take the feature vector of both patient and stack it up into a matrix, okay? Two vectors aligned with each other becomes a matrix, right? So it's a two by three matrix. So the output, so mathematically, so what would happen? You would have the sigmoid of the multiplication between that vector and that two by three matrix, uh, that three by two matrix, okay? So if you multiply this by this two by three matrix, it will give you a 2D vector that you give to a sigmoid and the output would be 0 0.125 and 0.99, okay? So if you stack up at the input, the feature vector of two patients, at the end, mathematically, at the end, your network is not going to return one value, it's going to return two values, which is the probability of belonging to the class one, like probability of being healthy for each of the two patients. And of course, this is what we call the mini batch. Okay, and you could, let's say you want to process four patients all at, uh, all at once, well, you stack their feature vector into a matrix, that would be a, um, uh, four by three matrix, feed it to the network, and then the network will have not one, not two, but four predictions, one prediction for each patient. Okay, mathematically, this just flows very naturally. And it has lots of very appealing properties, especially from the um, uh, processing power. Things get much faster when you process a lot of data this way. Now, you know, you have, we have this, this convnet, <coughs> which has lots of different layers, so lots of different operation. So let's say, for example, uh, this is an image that comes from the CIFAR-10 data set, and at the output, CIFAR-10 has 10 classes, so the output are 10 different neurons that predict the probability of that image of being a horse or a dog or a truck and so on and so forth. Well, you can have a mini batch of four images. If you stack up four images, then, <coughs> Things don't change. I mean, things just go very naturally all the way to the end. It's just that at the end, you have four predictions for your four images. 
And usually, typically, when you train a data set, there's a, this very important buzzword. Again, uh, in, in the end zone session tomorrow and after tomorrow, you, you'll see this buzzword all over the place. What is the size of your mini batch? Okay, how many images that you want to, to use when you train? Uh, you first do an iteration. Stochastic gradient descent. One iteration is done with one input vector, one input image, for example. Usually, we that is kind of slow. So usually, we want to use more than one image. We'll use two, three, four, five, sometimes 32, 128. In fact, you use as many typically as many images in your mini batch as your, your GPU can handle, okay? Um, so that's for the mini batch thing, okay? Uh, what can we do? There's many applications uh, of ConvNets. It will be the, t the topic of tomorrow's uh, presentation, just for you to know. You can do classification. So you take an input image, and at the end of the, your network, you predict a class, like here, uh, you're predicting that this is a articulated truck, uh, this is a car, this is a van. Uh, here, uh, it's a very well-known data set. You can predict uh, who's who, okay? So that, that is this person. Or you can say that this is a male, this is a female, or this is an, uh, an elder, this is a young child, these kinds of things, okay? So you're doing classification. This example is a very good example of I give, feed you with an image, and you tell me if that image seems normal or, or abnormal, okay? Uh, segmentation, this is very typical. So, so Christian will show tomorrow how you can do segmentation, but at the end of the day, it's a series of convolution, and your input is an uh, image, and the output is a prediction for each pixel. So you're, you have a, a prediction, so it's a linear classification for every single pixel, and in this case, it would be a Two class prediction. I think this is a, uh, a pro the image of a prostate. Uh, this is the image of a, a heart with a left ventricle, right ventricle. Um, and so for each pixel, the, the, the system at the very end has a linear classifier. Okay, for predict for each pixel, is it in that class or that other class? Uh, here's another example of uh, image segmentation. Uh, this is a work we, we did some time ago with some colleagues. Um, so segmenting uh, brain tumors. Uh, localization, putting bounding boxes around uh, here, it would be vehicles or pedestrians, or here around uh, things that look like a tumor, or at least that is abnormal. This is a task called localization uh, that is often done with CNNs. So, um, Okay, so that, that goes through the end of my presentation. And then I would like to go through this, what I call the little game. I have 15 minutes left. So what's the, the thing? Okay, ConvNets and CNNs are very great. And uh, uh, it, it's very tempting you know, to cheer up and to say, uh, we are at the eve of that great revolution where AI will redefine how medicine is being, you know, done and will redefine the relationship a doctor has with his uh, patient. But th this, this is kind of naive because there are many pathological situations. There are several pitf pitfalls during the roundtable uh, discussion. Some of those problems have been kind of uh, underlined. So I'm going to, so machine learning have limits and we have to know it. Okay. Otherwise, we might end up having all kinds of troubles. Um, so let's play a game. How can machine learning go wrong in medical imaging? Okay. So with this little uh, class I had with you. Um, okay. So the, the game is as follows. Uh, let's say we'll divide the room. Okay, left, right, and uh, let's say the people more in front. And those that are in the back, so like team one, team two, team three, and team four, okay? And uh, like all of the specialists and so professors that already do machine learning cannot answer questions, okay? Because that would be too easy. So uh, uh, it's only for students or beginners or uh, uh, I think there are a couple of doctors. You can answer, no problem. So I will give you, I will show you some limitations of machine learning in areas that are not in uh, medical imaging. So the thing is that you just raise your hand 
and give me an example in medical imaging where that kind of problem can show up, okay? So let's start. First, uh, first case, okay? Let's say, for example, you have a task for ev evaluating the age of a person, okay? So for example, you train a neural network, it's a ConvNet. At the end of the ConvNet, you have uh, 100 different classes. You want to predict cla uh, uh, you know, age. You, you suppose people are between z age of zero to 100, okay? And so you have this data set, a uh, well-known data set called the celebrity data set. So you have faces of male and female of different ages. So you train your, your data set. It works super well. You're very happy. And then you feed your uh, neural net with an image that is different. So that person uh, is not front facing the, the camera. So it's seen on the side. It's wearing a, um, a hat, which, is, which has never been seen, and it has uh, dark skin. Um, so this kind of problem gives rise to what we call ethics in AI. So that means you'll probably, uh, so the, the network, the, the problem is that the network will make a prediction. Okay, but how can you rely on that prediction since that person was never seen? So in medical imaging, when does, do you believe that this situation can arrive? This is, this is uh, new time. This is a what? A new kind of disease? Um, a new kind, let's say, let, let, let's say, when does, I would say, uh, okay, a new kind of disease, I would say uh, half a point, okay? <laughs> so that team now has half a point. Uh, especially ethics, think about ethics in AI. When your neural network was trained and it was trained on a biased data, and so it will, you know, poorly treat a certain category of people. Okay? Yeah, 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 Thanks. here. So, from the same team, so you already have <laughs> half a point. I think we'll have to target some specific uh, person, uh, people, like we said yesterday. Um, and those, uh, this will arise some problems with uh, ethics because yes. we'll have to target specific groups. Yes, and specific uh, ethnic groups. Like for example, okay, there's this uh, very famous paper that got published not so long ago on um, skin cancer. So you take a smartphone, take a picture of your uh, of your uh, skin because there's a you know there's a spot on it, and you want to know is this skin cancer or not. Well, if that that system was trained on white skin cancer. Uh, how can you generalize with people that have a darker skin color? Okay, this is bias, right? So we have, we have to keep in mind that uh, this can be a problem. Another type of biased data. Okay, so this is a uh, uh, this comes from a project I I, I, I had some time ago. So uh, we had a training data set, and the goal was to recognize different types of vehicles, like for example, cars versus trucks. And now in the test data, we kind of realized that in some categories, the network was very bad. It was a categories of trucks, okay? Because in the training data set, there was mostly what we called articulated trucks, which is a certain type of truck. But in a test set, there was a different type of truck, okay? Which is not an articulated truck. And so because of that, the test set is, was not exactly the same in the training set. It was very poorly generalizing. So how do you think in medical imaging, a situation like that can occur? You train on a certain type of data, okay? Like certain type of trucks, but then you see different types of trucks, okay? They're still trucks, but it's, they, they don't look the same, see? See here and there and there, they're not articulated trucks. Yes, again, from that team, 1.5 points, zero, zero, zero. Uh, when you are taking image, for instance, from uh, different institutions or different scanners? Or, uh, from the, um, in this case, not exactly. So I cannot give you the point, but keep, <laughs> keep in mind that answer, okay, for later. Of a team, yeah? Not exactly. In fact, it was mentioned yesterday by a person here. Yes. 
if you train on data that uh, contains mostly disease patients and then you test on a, sub on a population that has uh, mostly known disease. You, have, you train on a data set that contains only diseased people? Uh, mostly diseased people, because that's the data that you, you are mostly provided usually. Okay. And uh, when you test it, you have some patients that do not have disease, so they are hardly detected. It, okay, this is, again, keep, keep that answer for an, a, another question later on. Okay, I'm going to give you a, a, a cue, or at least uh, maybe the answer. You train your data set to recognize different type of tumor. Okay, let's say a glioblastoma in the brain. Okay, so that's the, your data set comes from here, the shoe, uh, and they're targeting a certain type of glioblastoma, and it's yet an, a glioblastoma, and another glioblastoma, and another glioblastoma. So your, your neural network is very good at, that's what you believe, segmenting tumors in the brain. Now you get a new patient that comes that have a different type of tumor in the brain. It's a tumor, it's a white spot, but it's not a glioblastoma. It's a uh, melin, 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 exactly, metastasis. Yes, but I didn't have this one in mind, but let's say metastasis, easier to say. So it's a, it's, it's, it is a tumor, but it's a different type of tumor, okay? It's like a truck versus a truck. These are two trucks. Wait a second. No, this truck is an articulated truck. It has a specific shape. And this other one is, okay, it's a truck, but it has definitely a different kind of shape. Well, two tumors. It's a tumor. It's a tumor. They don't have exactly. So if you want to have a tumor detection system, make sure you have every single possible types of tumors in your training data set. Otherwise, it's not going to generalize well. It will specialize at recognizing one specific type of tumor, and it will potentially say when you, you, you look at the different type of tumor, say, oh, that's LC. It's, it, it will say LC because it doesn't look like a, a glioblastoma, for example, okay? Um, okay, let's say in this case, you have a training data set. Again, uh, you have an equal number of cars and trucks, and then you want to generalize on a test data set that has mo mainly cars and rare, you, you know, that, not that many trucks. Okay, like for example, let's say you, you stick a camera out there here on the street, you'll see mostly uh, vehicles, cars, and not that many trucks. One truck, one, you know, once in a time. So how does that generalize so, to medical imaging? Can I only answer that one? Yeah. Yeah, yes, exactly. That was the answer uh, the, that was given there. So let's say one point for you uh, for that question that you kind of... Uh, <laughs> And the intuition it was coming over. It's a kind of um, prediction. Let's say, for example, you have a data set. Again, let's say uh, you, you, you want to classify uh, people with a tumor versus people with non-tumor. If you have an equal number of, of, of patients with tumor versus non-tumor in your training data set, well, in your test data set, it should also be in this way. If it's not in this way, then your, your network is going to hallucinate people with tumors, okay? Because it was like trained to do this. So it's very important that the distribution of test data and training data is the same. And that's the, this is very difficult, right? Because distribution might change from country to another. Um, it might change from how do you get to select one person to go through the, 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 the deep neural net uh, validation, okay? So if one hospital decides, okay, each uh, patient that enters the hospital goes through the ConvNet uh, validation versus we only send those that we truly believe that they have a problem, okay? So, okay, another example, you have, in your training data set, you have high resolution images. In a test data set, you have low resolution images, okay? This is an actual problem that we had, so, did they, yes? I don't want to change the software we use in medical imaging. Like we have, uh, how do you say it, mise à jour? An update of the software, and then we change, uh, we have like high quality or high resolution images. Ah, uh, you, you change uh, it. Because it happens for me. We're working like on OCT and geography images, and we oh. change the software, so it's a... Uh, Ah, okay, I see. Uh, I, I guess that's a good answer. Uh, a, a very typical answer, let's say, uh, in, in my uh, field of research in medical imaging is the MRI. So you have those th 3 Tesla MRI and 1.5 Tesla MRI, like the high-resolution MRI and the low-resolution MRI, okay? 
And usually those data, they look very similar, but they're not, not quite the same. So if you only train on high-res type of images and say, wow, my system is so great, uh, well, it might perform poorly on different types of, okay? Uh, fine grain annotation. So what is it, fine grain annotation? These are data with a very small interclass distance, okay? Let me show you an example of that, okay? This is a paper from uh, 2018, so it's not very old, and their goal is to uh, recognize or classify different types of birds that are pictured in their you know, natural environment. How complicated that is. I mean, a bird on a, in, in a tree, how can you, it's, a bird looks like a bird, it looks like a yet another bird, but I mean, they were trying, so this is called fine grain annotation, okay? So this is very difficult. Uh, how do you think that translates to, machine learning, to medical imaging? Fine grain annotation. Something that looks like something that looks like something, but yet they're all different. Uh, maybe the soft tissues, uh, for example, in the ball movements, whenever we are segmenting the prostates. So oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Soft yeah okay, tissues, that's, that's, uh, a good, that, that's a good example. Yes. Uh, you have different type of tissue. You want to segment an image. Okay, good point. So uh, I think you, you now have... Uh, 2.5 points, they have one point, and now you have one point, so 2.5, zero. I don't know what you, you are doing. Uh, <laughs> it's a joke. Um, uh, but it, that's a very good example. Let's say you want to segment an image, and you want to segment, um, as you're saying, one soft tissue that is connected to another soft tissue, and visually, it looks like just one blob. But we know that this section here is, associated to a, one specific organ, and that other area there is yet another organ. But in the image, you see absolutely barely no difference. Okay? That's a very good example, yes. Or it could be also be, let's say you want to grade, find what kind of can cancer grade that you have based on some information. And honestly, from grade one, two, one and two, and between grade three and four, there's almost no difference. Okay, this would also be considered as fine grain annotation. And for this to work, you need to have a very powerful network because you, you, know, you have to unfold your area and to make things linearly separable. But for this to work and not overfit, you need a huge number of data. Okay, okay strong class imbalance. Okay, let me give you an example. Let's say 99.9% .9 of that data is in one class and 0.1% is, is is in the other class. It's not like little class invariance like I mentioned before. It's strong, very strong class in imbalance. Let me show you two examples of this. Fall detection, okay? Uh, a company came to me uh, some time ago saying, I want to develop a fall detection algorithm. How can I do this? And I said, you know what? You should be looking for <laughs> something else to do. Um, why? Because uh, how, you know, most of the time, people don't fall. So how do you build a data set for recognizing someone is falling on the ground? Okay, you go in, the, you select the people in their apartment, stick a camera there, and then start filming whatever they do in their everyday life. And then you film for weeks and months and maybe a year. And then you have a poor person go through these videos to you know, detect when the person is not falling, which is like all the time and uh, detect when the person is falling. So maybe after one year, you, you, know, you detected uh, four or five different falls, and that's it. That you, you have like one million examples of people not falling and five examples of people that actually fail. Okay? So this is extreme class imbalance. Same thing with crash detection. Okay? You stick a camera on the highway, and then you wait for a crash to happen, so you have an example of what does it look like a crash. Uh, you'll wait for a long time because most of the time there's no crash on the road, okay? This is huge class imbalance, okay? And in those cases, what happens is that neural network, they just end up being perfect. 
because they all say, you know, there's no fall, there's no crash, I'm good, I'm accurate 99.99%. In fact, the recall is very bad, okay? You're very bad at, you know, detecting something of interest, okay? You're looking for a fall, you're just not detecting it. So overall, since there's a strong class imbalance, the, the network just don't learn nothing. It learned to do nothing. In medical imaging, how do you think that transfers? A very rare pathology. This is a good example. Yes, so one point for this group. Finally. So, um, uh, yes, a very rare pathology. So you have lots of examples of healthy people or maybe people that are sick but that don't have exactly that pathology. And then you're looking for that uh, super rare pathology. You have one, two examples, three examples. Uh, and that's it. Well, if that's all you have, machine learning is probably not going to help you because it's just too rare. You have too few examples. Or if it's, you really want to use machine learning, you better know what you're doing. Otherwise, your, uh, your network is going to hallucinate healthy people. Right? Uh, abnormal data. Okay. Remember, we learned to find uh, a separation plane that mathematically is infinite. So any point in this feature space will eventually be uh, classified, okay? So let's say you have this is very simple example that you know, I showed you at the beginning. We take the temperature and the cardiac frequency of two person, blah, 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 okay. And you have the healthy and the sick, okay. And then you have this infinite line that separates the, the, the space in two. And then you have a new patient that comes to the hospital he falls there, okay, uh, his, his body temperature is kind of low, but that's okay. His frequency, cardiac frequency is like crazy high, 300 uh, pulsation a minute, but hey, it falls on the, uh, you know, on the, on, on the healthy side of the border, so hey, you're, you're, you're healthy, you can go back home. So, this is a, a, a joke example, it's a funny example, but it was uh, outlined by um, uh, yesterday, I don't remember his name, uh, yesterday's uh, talk, um, yesterday evening, on the, um, on the retina analysis, where essentially he had a software that's apparently super great, and uh, eventually saw uh, a tumor, uh, an image with a tumor in it, that was some sort of outlier that the system never saw. And um, since the, you know, the system never saw that, but it was an outlier, it ended up falling on the wrong side in that case of the, the border and was classified as being healthy, okay? So again, this is, this, this is a problem with the, you know, how do you handle abnormality? And, and, and machine, that's, that's a trouble with machine learning because machine learning, at the end, your network will always give you a prediction. And sometimes the network will be very confident in this prediction. What's, uh, what's the difference between the abnormal data and the rare cases, the previous example? What is the difference between? between oh, no, the, the rare cases is, is like you, you, have, uh, you have one million uh, example of healthy people and three examples of sick people. So you have so, many, so few examples that uh, there's, there's not much you can learn out of it. Uh, an example of, abno of abnormal data is this example here uh, that I found on uh, the Huffing, uh, on online magazine, where essentially it's, it was a, uh, you know, I, I, someone was behind a wheel, but it was a system for automatic driving. And then uh, the system saw a car going in the you know, opposite direction. Well, that's a, the system. I've never saw a car going in the opposite direction. Most of the time, you know, there, that system would, you would see car in front of, you know, your vehicle, but going in the correct direction. And in fact, the system learns to follow the car right in front of you. Well, if you have a car that is not, you know, going in the correct direction, you better not just drive through and just try to follow, follow that vehicle, okay? You should go, go left or right. This is abnormal data. And again, uh, uh, handling ab abnormal data is kind of a problem. Okay, so that ends up my presentation. Thank you. We can thank the speaker.
Thank you a lot. Thank you a lot, Kamak. Uh, well, we have time for a few questions, but very few. Yeah, we're five Otherwise, minutes late, so Yeah, sorry. that's true, but yeah, OK. Last question. Maybe one question, yes. OK. Hello. So uh, when you talk about data, there are two things uh, usually. Uh, one is the complexity of the data, and the second thing is the amount of data. So for example, uh, say brain data or a lung data, in the, complex, uh, in the complexity it might be different. But uh, so when you're dealing with amount of data, complexity, and a neural network, so how do you uh, manage the trade-off? For example, a complex data might require a deeper network to understand the features of the data. So uh, the three things, uh, how do you manage them? The complexity and the amount of data versus the depth depth of a neural network? Versus the depth of a network. That's a very good question. Uh, I don't know any obvious answer to that question. Uh, complexity of the data. Well, OK, first and foremost, uh, I would like to say that complexity of the data isn't necessarily related to the dimensionality of the data. Sometimes people say, OK, you have data in a high dimensional space, so it must be complicated. No. Um, when you're trying to separate things, if you're doing classification, <clears throat> yesterday it was mentioned that um, um, you can represent data on a smaller uh, latent space. Okay? So maybe data can be in a very high dimensional space, but they can be summarized by a much smaller latent space. And if it is the case, then you don't need that many samples to train correctly a data set. So in, Let's say, for example, your task is just to, if I show you an image, you just tell me if it's an, uh, I don't know, an, a CT scan image or an MRI image. So these modalities are very different. So probably you don't need that many examples, and you don't need a very deep neural network. Okay? Now, if you ha you're ending with what I was showing you, um, fine grain annotation, so it's very complex data especially if your data is in a very high dimensional space, then you better um, not only have a lot of training data, but uh, you need to make sure potentially to have a relatively deep network so that you learn enough features to discriminate you know, one type of data from the other type of data. I wish I had like a, a much better uh, answer to give you. I have a CVPR uh, paper this year uh, where we try to understand what it means, data complexity. Uh, let's say I, you just give me some data. Can I just, by looking at the data, figure out how, you know, how difficult it is? Um, we provide some answer to this. Uh, it would be hard to summarize it in, uh, in a few seconds. But at the end of the day, it all, bo all boils down to this latent representation. How does fundamentally complex, and, and there's no obvious way to answer that question. Uh, most of the time, what people do, they, they just try some generic uh, solutions. If it works well, great. If it doesn't work well, well, try a different solution or just hunt down for more data. And, uh, if it, it, and, and if it doesn't work, then uh, it's time to start research and uh, to develop a new model. Okay. Okay, uh, thank, thank you. you. Thank you again, Jean-Marc.